is 2017 and Ryzen is out. So let's take a look at a 10 year old CPU on an almost 15 year old architecture. Athlon 64 was a big deal for AMD. At the time, Intel's top CPU was the Pentium 4, which had many issues on its own, such that at launch it actually lost many benchmarks to the older Pentium 3. Intel's strategy was max clock speeds. It had the advantage of being easy to market. However, the architectural sacrifice that Intel made to allow Pentium 4 to reach those higher clock speeds meant that the Pentium 4 needed to reach very high clock speeds before it could even compete with the Pentium 3. In order to reach those speeds, they ended up having to also push a lot of voltage, and that created a lot of heat, which caused a lot of problems. AMD took a very different approach at the time. They favored IPC over raw clock speed. It was harder to market as it didn't have a nice number on the box, but it did mean that they outperformed Intel at the time. To try to mitigate the effects of this lack of a number for the box, AMD used their PR rating system, wherein they named CPUs after the equivalent clocked speed of a Pentium 4. Their decision to make a CPU that just performed better allowed them to stretch their architecture out from 2003 all the way to 2008 with a few tweaks along the way, such as allowing unbuffered RAM and supporting dual channel and creating the first true dual core CPU. They also made some decisions that, while not especially a noticeable improvement of performance at the time, did allow the architecture to still somewhat keep up in modern applications. The biggest forward-thinking improvement that they made to help pave the way for future CPUs was the release of Athlon 64 as the first consumer 64-bit processor, which did give it a small advantage in certain very specific benchmarks, but realistically the only noticeable advantage, even to this day, is the ability to utilize more than 4 gigs of memory. While this didn't make a real world of difference for most any at the time of launch, as 4 gigabytes was still the max for DDR1 memory for most every consumer board, and it took a while for Athlon 64 to move to DDR2, this did pave the way for future generations in software and CPUs to utilize more than 4 gigs of RAM. Similarly, Athlon 64 brought the first monolithic dual core CPU to market. At the time, few programs of any benefited from the dual core, and the mantra was, games don't benefit from dual cores. However, now two cores is hardly enough, especially with the IPC that Athlon 64 has in today's applications. So that brings up the question, can Athlon 64 keep up in 2017? To test this, I used an Athlon 64 X2 6400 Plus and a Gigabyte GAMA 790FX UD4P with 8 gigabytes of DDR2 800MHz and Crossfire R9-280s and a 240mm all-in-one cooler and running everything off of an SSD. To every degree possible, I made sure that the CPU is the only bottleneck in the system. Overclocking on this platform was pretty straightforward. I raised the multiplier in BIOS until it couldn't pass PIME95. I then started dropping the multiplier and raising the reference clock to maintain that clock speed, but raise that hypertransport speed as fast as possible. I also found in my testing that for some reason when I used the half multiplier there was a noticeable dip in performance, so I stuck with full multipliers. The only thing I could find that might cause this is memory speed, as the CPU does use a CPU divider rather than a straight multiplier, so a half multiplier could give us a weird memory speed. Um, however, I couldn't find any way to tell that for sure. Um, the final thing I did do to raise the performance was to raise the memory speed and tighten the timings as much as possible. As this CPU had already pretty much been tapped out for that architecture at 2.2 GHz stock, I wasn't able to get very far on the core speed, um, but I did manage to get the system stable at a reference clock speed of 350 and a CPU multiplier of 10 for a CPU speed of 3.5 GHz, but a hypertransport of 1750 MHz and RAM set at 880 MHz CL5. Before I get to my objective benchmarks to answer that question of can it keep up, I'd like to go over the results of my subjective test. As this is the first CPU that I'm reviewing in the series and will be adding results with each review, I will only be comparing between overclocked and non-overclocked and trying to see if there's a CPU bottleneck. I will also compare Crossfire versus Single Card to similarly test if the results are GPU limited rather than CPU limited. Let's start with Killing Floor 2, which is kind of the freebie. I was able to run it at max settings, nearly maxing out the 62 FPS that the engine allows all the time. I was even able to mostly maintain that FPS while recording at the maximum bit rate using VLive. My experience running Overwatch was, was that while it could not hold that all-important 60 FPS, it still averaged over 30 FPS most of the time, especially overclocked, and for the most part was relatively playable. With my low skill level, I could not distinguish enough of a competitive disadvantage to be considered an issue. On the other hand, Battlefield 1 had a lot of trouble actually getting into a game and deploying. Um, it ran at about 4 FPS until after it was overclocked. Once it was overclocked, I was able to run the game at about 17 FPS, but very choppily. And if I tried to focus on a target that was very far away at all, it was very hard, if not impossible, to hit because of the extreme low and choppy frame rate. GTA 5 was the most surprising result, though. 
the Athlon 64 is actually capable of running GTA 5 online at about 30 FPS, as long as you only wanted to walk around. Once you do start driving, especially in a fast car, um, the CPU will have a slight dip in frame rate, and then after that, it'd be pretty quick before the CPU can't keep up with the GPU for loading the textures, and the pop-on would be to the point where you actually can't see anything. There's no textures, it's just, just blank space. So, and you just see through to the sky map. So I would say that really um, this game is almost playable. If you just want to walk around, you can play the game. However, I mean, it's really not an optimal experience. And I would, I would say that you'd need better hardware if you wanted to run this game. Uh, I don't think anyone's really surprised though to say that a 10 year old CPU on a 15 year old architecture with only two cores is going to have trouble running GTA 5, but that's what I would have to say on that one. So to conclude this objective session, I would say that it currently can limp along if needed, but the Athlon 64 really is showing a seat. Overall, I would say that no one should be surprised that a 10-year-old CPU on a 15-year-old architecture barely keeps up, but the fact that it does it all is somewhat amazing. Um, now that we've gone over the touchy-feely subjective results that are harder to quantify with numbers, let's move to the objective results that won't directly lie to us. Since this is the first video in the series leading up to Ryzen, I do not have any scores to compare to for synthetic results, so I will stick to with the game results as the FPS numbers are more directly readable. I will have her link my spreadsheet in the description for the synthetic results because I did test that, and um, you're free to compare them yourself or reference them later. First on the plate is Ashes of the Singularity, which is known for being quite the hardcore benchmark. As we can see, the scores doesn't really change from extreme to low, so this benchmark is clearly 100% held back by the CPU. Um, its average frame rate are all so low that I'd say this is one game that you wouldn't be able to play on the CPU for a number of reasons, one of which is the, just the straight up lack of performance in the CPU. However, there's also the memory limitation of the AM2 platform. Ashens will not run on the crazy setting with 8 gigs of RAM. And similarly, it's also unable to run with multi-GPU enabled on anything but the lowest setting with less than 8 gigs of RAM. Overall, I would say I think it's not surprising to say that this benchmarking game barely runs on the Athlon 64 platform. The next game that I benchmarked was Batman Arkham Asylum. It is an older game and less demanding, however, it is still somewhat demanding and measurable. Um, so we do see that the CPU holds this game back, especially with his X enabled, since it is run on the CPU when using that in an AMD GPU. As far as the results, I would say the game is still plenty playable, especially if you disable PhysX. We do actually see a dip in performance going from one card to Crossfire, which shows that this game is definitely limited by the Athlon 64 and not the graphics horsepower. The loss in performance is likely due to additional driver overhead when running Crossfire versus a single card. However, also do note that because this game is CPU bound in this case, we did see a very noticeable jump going from 3.2 GHz to 3.5 GHz with an overclocked hyper transport and Titan timings. That said, I would still put this game in the same camp as Killing Floor 2, easily playable even on the Athlon 64 because it still mostly maintains frame rates over 60 FPS, unless it is a PhysX scene, which you should have disabled anyways if you're not using a NVIDIA GPU. After Arkham Asylum, we move to Metro Last Light, which I would put the performance carable to Overwatch as long as PhysX is disabled. However, for this benchmark run, we did have PhysX enabled so that would be why your minimums average are where they are. Without physics, you can expect nearer to 30 FPS than 20. Um, but overall, I would say this game is still playable if you are still running an Athlon 64X2. Finally, we have Tomb Raider, which ran fine and actually does not seem to be held back by the Athlon 64 at all, so much as the GPU is this game, as overclocking didn't yield any noticeable performance difference, um, but switching to Crossfire did see a jump of nearly 20 FPS up from 30-ish to almost 50 FPS. Um, it is still GPU limited in this zero because we still don't see the overclock CPU pull ahead even with Crossfire enabled. So in conclusion, Athlon 64 definitely shows its age in current day applications. However, it is still capable of some light gaming um, and modern day applications. So would I recommend for someone to go out and buy an Athlon 64 system today? No, not really. I'd value an Athlon 64 X2 with 8 gigs of RAM at $20 um, for that system, then that's more just for the value of the RAM. But if you happen to have some spare parts lying around and you're wondering if you'd be able to make a gaming machine for perhaps a relative or a friend who's not so well off, then an Athlon 64, especially with 8 gigs of RAM, 
and especially if you overclock it, we'll still keep up for some light, light gaming and um, more productivity for another couple of years. But overall, it's definitely reaching the end of life. Anyways, that wraps up this review for today. Um, if you like the video, please like. If you uh, want to see more of this, subscribe and let me know. If there's any tests you want to see me test differently or any problems with the test, feel free to let me know down in the comments. Also, um, you know, please do provide any feedback. It does help, I, and I do try and act on it. I will link all of my spreadsheets down in the description as well as my, um, my validation for the overclocking. Uh, other than that, um, just have a great rest of your day.